Hi folks, welcome back. Today we'll be shifting gears towards studying the behavioral and social learning approach to understanding personality. We'll be talking about the theory, application assessment, and the relevant research under this approach. The outline for today's presentation will be, we will describe and conceptualize what behaviorism is, we will look at the pioneers of the behaviorist approach in psychology, who are Watson, Pavlov, Thorndike, Skinner, Rotter, and Bandura. We will look at all of these um, pioneers in this field. We will talk about the basic principles of conditioning, the social learning theory, the social cognitive theory, and then we will look at the application and assessment of these theories into real life. And we will end the presentation looking at the strengths and criticisms of the behavioral and social learning approach. So when we look at behaviorism, John B. Watson, John B. Watson comes to mind. Um, John Watson is, was the father of the behaviorist approach, and in 1913, he was a young and brash psychologist who wrote, who published an article titled Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. This article signaled the beginning of a new movement in psychology called behaviorism. So he is the founder of the behaviorist movement. He argued that if psychology is to be a science, psychologists must stop examining mental states only the observable was reasonable subject matter for a science. And because subjective inner states and feelings cannot be observed or measured in an agreed upon accurate manner, they have no place in psychology. The sooner psychology abandons these topics, Watson maintained, the sooner it can become a respectable member of the scientific community. So you can see here, when we started talking about the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic approach to understanding personality, and then when you look at the behaviorist approach to understanding personality, you see a real shift in emphasis towards making it very, very, very scientific. John Watson's goal was to make psychology so scientific that you could, your focus must only remain on the observable. Um, ignoring the mental states, the, the inner psychic phenomena. And so you get to see the other end of the extreme within the, across the lenses through which we've been understanding personality. So behaviorism, first of all, um, personality under behaviorism is described as the end result of one's history of conditioning. So before we understand what conditioning is, it, it's important to know that what overt behavior is. So overt behavior is that which can be observed, predicted, and controlled by scientists. I'm sorry about that, that's my puppy. Every time he hears the fire engine outside, he, he starts barking. So overt behavior is something that can be observed, predicted, and controlled by scientists. And um, so the purpose of behaviorism is to study this overt behavior. And the principles that help explain human behavior can be divided into both classical and operant conditioning. In other words, when you hear the word conditioning, just think and know that it's the same as or synonymous to programming. So when you program something, right? So there's the classical programming, how you classically get programmed to behave in a certain way. And then there's the operant programming where certain things, certain consequences, um, operations end up um, conditioning or programming you the way you act and behave. So let's get down to the first pioneer, who is Ivan Pavlov. Um, Ivan Pavlov was born in 1845-49. He was a Russian physiologist known primarily for his work in classical conditioning. Um, from his childhood days, Pavlov demonstrated intellectual curiosity along with an unusual energy that which he 
referred to as the instinct for research, inspired by the progressive ideas which he learned from a literary critique known as Dmitri Pissarro. Um, Pavlov abandoned his religious career and devoted his life to science. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and um, he is he became the first Russian Nobel laureate. So you can see he's a very accomplished person and definitely very knowledgeable and a pioneer on its own. He pioneered this idea called classical conditioning and he was a radical behaviorist along with his other proponents which we will study later which will be a Skinner and um, and the, the, the remaining that we will cover today. So he challenged the extent to which one is able to observe the inner causes of one's behavior. And so the whole idea of his proposition was, is, can actually be divided into four groups. So pay very careful attention here. And you must have probably heard of this many times before, especially if you're within the field of psychology, specializing in this area. But just to give you a glimpse of this again, unconditioned stimulus, in other words, just think of it as something natural, okay? Like a natural stimulus, something that's unprogrammed, untrained, okay? And then you have the unconditioned response, which is like a natural reflex, like a natural response, like an unprogrammed, untrained response. And what happens is this natural stimulus can become a program stimulus, which elicits a program response, which determines your behavior in a programmed manner. And so his whole conceptualization of classical conditioning falls under these four facets, these four primary facets. So let's look at an example. So this dog right the unconditioned stimulus is the natural stimulus which is food and we know as human beings as all living things when food comes into the picture we have a natural response which is salivating or feeling hungry or wanting to eat the food because it's a natural response to a natural stimulus now what happens is when you present a neutral stimulus in the presence of this natural stimulus and you keep presenting both of them together, so the whistle is presented with the natural stimulus, the dog starts associating the whistle, the sound of the whistle, to the amazing natural response he feels to the food. And so when the whistle sound is struck, the dog feels as naturally responsive to the sound of the whistle as the dog was naturally responsive to the food. And therefore, Pavlov said that he could actually program this doggy to respond or to behave in a certain way if he was able to club something that was not really stimulating any response in the dog with something that simulated a natural response in the dog. And so this picture does a very good job of explaining classical conditioning. So we'll move on to the next part, which is operant conditioning. Now, operant conditioning also has a very interesting history. At about the time Pavlov was dem demonstrating classical conditioning in Russia, American psychologists were investigating another type of learning through association. Edward Thorndike put stray cats into, so this is Edward Thorndike right here, and this was what was happening in America at the, around the same time what was happening in Russia. And so, um, Edward Thorndike put stray cats into puzzle boxes to escape from the box and thereby obtain a piece of fish. The hungry cats had to engage in a particular combination of actions. Before long, the cats learned what they had to do to receive their reward. These observations helped Thorndike formulate the law of effects, that behaviors are more likely to be repeated if they led to satisfying consequences and less likely to be repeated if they led to unsatisfying consequences. 
Pontax cats repeated the required behaviors because their actions led to the satisfying consequences of escape and food. Edward Thundike is famous in psychology for his work on learning theory that led to the development of operant conditioning within behaviorism. So here still we can see that he was a precursor of operant conditioning, not really the, the person who coined this term, um, but who coined the term called law of effect, where behaviors are more likely to be repeated if they're led to satisfying consequences and less likely to be repeated if they lead to unsatisfying consequences. Now, operant conditioning, the term was actually coined by B.F. Skinner, and we will jump right into more about B.F. Skinner. So, B.F. Skinner is right here, this guy. He was born in Pennsylvania. His father was a lawyer, announced the birth of Skinner in the local newspaper. He grew up in a warm and stable home and planned a career as a professional writer. But he didn't feel that it was the right place for him, so he picked up psychology as his next career, and he got into Harvard and ended up completing his psychology degree there. Um, so he, oh, during his career in the field of psychology, he... Um, he placed a rat in a special cage called the Skinner box that has a bar or pedal on one wall that when pressed causes a little mechanism to release a food pellet into the cage. The rat is moving around the cage when it accidentally presses the bar and as a result of pressing the bar a food pellet falls into the cage. The operant is the behavior just prior to the reinforcer which is the food pellet. So the behavior is the operant which goes prior to the reinforcer. In a relatively short period, the time the rat learns to press the bar whenever it wants food. So here, what Skinner did was by experimenting with rats and pigeons, he trained them how to respond in a certain way based on the positive reinforcement. This leads to one of the principles of operant conditioning, which is a behavior followed by a reinforcing stimulus results in an increased probability of that behavior occurring again in the future. So here, what I want you to now look at is the different types of operant conditioning principles, okay? The two main are positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And when, when what reinforcement basically means is that it's the consequence that increases the frequency of a behavior. So remember, as soon as you hear the word reinforcement, don't, don't think about positive or negative yet. But just the fact that it's a reinforcement means it increases behavior. Okay? The positive means that something is added to increase the behavior, which is the reward. And the negative means something is, that is aversive, is removed from the environment to increase the behavior. Okay? And now when we look at punishment, any type of punishment, positive, negative, regardless, punishment is something that decreases behavior. Okay, so positive punishment is when you give something aversive that decreases behavior. So you slap someone or you hit someone to decrease that behavior. Negative punishment is when you take something ple pleasing. So let's say you ground someone, you take away their freedom. That leads to um, decreasing the behavior. Negative is something you remove, positive is something you give. Extinction is basically also decreasing behavior, but you do not need to reward behavior anymore. It's already extinct. So there were other basic principles that he proposed as well under operant conditioning, something known as shaping, which is reinforcing successive approximations of the desired behavior. It's useful in teaching complex behaviors. So it's it's just like training dogs. You you give them treats and then you train them how to roll over. You treat them how to listen. You you treat them different tricks. And so shaping is basically teaching people or dogs or other animals how to um, 
like mold their behaviors in a certain way to shape their behaviors in a certain way the next is generalization and generalization is generalizing a response of a specific stimulus to another stimulus so let's say that the dog started um, responding naturally to the whistle now what the dog does is the sound of the whistle can be generalized to any other sound that vaguely or closely sounds like the whistle so let's say the sound of a car the sound of a honk the sound of um, a siren so any of those things make they generate the same response in the dog and that's generalization discrimination is when you're able to differentiate between rewarding and non-rewarding stimuli so dis discrimination under operant conditioning means that the dog only responds to the sound of the whistle not to the sound of the car not to the sound of the honk and so that's an example of discrimination um, so these are the three basic principles of operant conditioning and now we're going to shift gears towards social learning theory. So what basically happened was now that we were introduced to these radical behaviorists, psychologists started questioning the assertion that all human learning is the result of classical or, or operant conditioning. The prospect for survival would be slim indeed if one could learn only from consequences of trial and error, one psychologist wrote. Why couldn't internal events like thoughts and attitudes be conditioned the same way as overt behaviors? For example, paranoid individuals who believe evil agents are out to get them might have been reinforced in the past for these beliefs. Thus, this type of thinking is what began the transition from traditional behaviorism to a number of approaches known collectively as social learning theory. And so here, you're actually seeing the inclusion of society, of social, of thoughts, and the way people believe, the way people think. So you can see a little bit of pattern across the psychodynamic as well as behaviorist approach. If you put them on a continuum, they are extreme ends of the spectrum, right? Psychodynamic is one end of the spectrum, and behaviorism is on the other end. And throughout the school, two schools of thoughts, neo-Freudians, post-behaviorism, social learning theorists, all of their goals was to bring about a moderation, a balance, and introduce the concept of the person in the equation. So it's not just the environment, it's not just your unconscious mind, but it is, at the end of the day, the beliefs you hold. The beliefs, the thoughts can also be shaped by your environment and by you. So behavior, environment, behavior, interactions, the environment influences people's behavior, which in turn determines the environment people like to be a part of. Individual provides their reinforcers. Julian Rotter was a very famous pioneer under this theory. He was born in 1916. Um, he went to the University of Indiana for his PhD because it was one of the few schools at the time to offer a degree in clinical psychology. He wanted an academic position, but few were available when Rotter graduated in 1941. After working in a hospital for a year, he served as a psychologist in the Army and later the Air Force during World War II. Rotter's basic formula for predicting behavior is how you potentially behave depends on two crucial variables. You can see the formula right here. So behavior potential equals expectancy plus reinforcement value. So what he's saying is that expectancies are what we believe will happen if we act a certain way. Reinforcement values, that is how much we think we will like each of the possible consequences we expect. So what he's saying through this basic formula, which is known as Rogers basic formula, is that your potential to behave in a certain way is dependent upon what expect you have from your environment as well as how those expectations are reinforced so let's say you're in a relationship and the reason I give a lot of examples with relationships is because a lot of people can relate to this and so let's say you're in a relationship you're dating someone and then you are super insecure at the beginning of the relationship because it's still 
sort of the beginning and you don't really you really into this person you don't really know if they are really into you or not into you and so your potential for behaving is dependent upon what you expect if you expect that they don't like you as much that they will reject you and then it's matched with their reinforcement such as them not texting you as much or them not responding to you as quickly as you might expect. What happens is your behavior becomes predictable upon these facets and you end up behaving in ways such as becoming anxious, maybe being feeling insecure, maybe going out of the way texting them like a gazillion messages at once. And so that's how your behavior is shaped based on your expectancy and the value of the reinforcements you receive. Now, observe this. It isn't just reinforcement. It's called reinforcement value, which is an interesting proposition because reinforcements can be, you know, just reinforcements, but it's the value you put onto them. So let's say someone texts you and you don't put much value onto the act of texting. You're like, ah, eh, it's okay. It doesn't define how the person feels about me. Then the reinforcement doesn't really have that much of an effect. So at the end of the day, it's also the value you put onto the reinforcement. Okay. So on the other hand, expect that your expectation is that this person, regardless of whether they like you or not, you are you are awesome the way you are and you're doing well and then the reinforcement value is that you are feeling good by yourself you don't really it doesn't really matter whether the reinforcement is coming from the person or not it's the reinforcement is coming from you you feel good about yourself you your good feelings are reinforcing and you value your good feelings and those are reinforcing you and then your expectations are like okay whatever like i'm i am my person i'm gonna enjoy my time and so your behavior will also be very um sort of calm relaxed you won't get anxious you won't go out of the way and go all crazy on someone if they don't really um you know message you or something like that so think about it in terms of how you can relate this to your own lives and certain instances in your own lives because it makes a lot of sense so another thing that Rotter proposed was the idea of locus of control. And locus of control has to do a lot with um, the type of um, focus one puts on what determines their sort of, um, what controls how they think, feel, and behave, okay? So the locus of control can be divided into internal and external and what this means is that if you have an internal locus of control it means whatever is happening in your life your thoughts beliefs feelings are coming from your inside okay they are controlled by how you feel on the inside everything is an inside job when you when you have an external locus of control that means that your thoughts feelings behaviors beliefs all of these are geared towards the external. They're coming from the external part of you. And so internal locus of control, who believe they can control most things, people can affect what happens to them, good and bad experiences are of people's own making. So this is similar to what we spoke about under the humanistic approach, where we said that you are the creator of your life. You make choices that you want. You're not stuck anywhere. You choose to be or not, right? And so this has a lot of, uh, this type of thinking, this type of believing is known as internal, in, is known as having an internal locus of control. An external locus of control is when people who believe that what happens to them and others is outside of their control, okay? So your faith in yourself, it comes from outside. The way, the way people make you feel about yourself, it comes from the outside. And so an important question for you to ask yourself here is what is, your life what is determining your life is it the inside job or is it you're waiting for the environment to define you so let's look at a little bit of research ar around this area 
So they looked at the relationship between locus of control, well-being, and achievement, and they found that students with an internal locus of control received higher grades and better teacher evaluations than externals. The reasons were that they saw themselves as being responsible for their achievements and they tended to attribute high test scores to their abilities or to studying hard. So people who got higher grades, basically they're taking responsibility for their own success in life. Like this is up to me, I'm going to work hard and make it happen versus people who just put it on the external world like oh my teacher didn't teach me that well oh my teacher didn't check my homework oh my teacher didn't make sure that i i practice the practice questions so you are always blaming the external world but research has found that internally oriented students are the ones who do better now let's look at the relationship between locus of control well-being and psychological disorders People suffering from psychological disorders tend to be more external than internal. Now think about that just for a second. Pause and just think about that for a second. People suffering from psychological disorders tend to be more external than internal. What is happening here? Remember how I told you earlier, how I shared with you in the previous presentations, that a psychopathology is nothing but the experience, the, the, um, the position you take where you say that your mind is controlling you and you are not controlling your mind anymore. So a psychopathology becomes a psychopathology basically because that con that is something that is controlling you. You're not in control anymore. So do you see how people who suffer from psychological disorders have this external locus of control? So they, they're not in control internally anymore. The reasons for connection between locus of control and depression connects actually to the research on learned helplessness. Now think about one example of a psychopathology, which is depression, okay? Why do people become depressed? If people, they found that people become depressed because they feel helpless, they feel hopeless, they feel like they don't have that internal locus of control to determine that quality of helplessness, to shift that quality of hopelessness. They, they believe that they feel that they need external help. They need, they, they have that internal part of themselves missing that actually helps them shape and influence this locus of control. So of the millions who try to lose weight each year, this is another example, only a small number of people succeed in taking it off and keeping it off. Why? Because one variable that may affect a diet's success or failure is the extent to which the dieter believes that he or she is capable of losing the weight. So when you start believing that you have that internal locus of control to lose your weight, you are not depending on anyone else, then you do achieve it. As long as you you depend on others to say, oh, my trainer didn't help me as much. Oh, um, you know, I don't have that potential to lose weight. I'm always like falling off the wagon. When you start telling yourself things that makes you lose that internal sense of control, then it's what keeps the weight back up again. So it's very, very important where you find yourself and everything is an inside job and you have to train yourself to have more of this internal locus of control to reach a place of equilibrium in your lives where you are controlling your life and your life is not controlling you you are making choices and decisions where you feel like the creator and not like the victim Clients tend to become more internal as they pass through successful psychotherapy. So what is the whole point of psychotherapy? It's telling the, the it's teaching the client to become more internal as you're passing through 
successful psychotherapy. You, you build this ego capacity in the client. You teach them that they are more in control of their lives. They have these internal mechanisms that they can control. So the whole point of therapy is to be able to, first of all, unfold what these, um, what these out of control parts of you are, and then to know, to build this internal core of you that creates a better, more successful external world for you because you are controlled by your internal world. Responses of clients when therapists focus on giving clients more control over therapy. What happened was when they did this research where they wanted to see the response of clients, they found that external sometimes do better when treatment remains in the therapist's hands. And internals respond well when given control over their treatment. And so they found that even people who are naturally externally or internally having this locus of control, the externals depend more on the therapist, right? Again, they want the external environment to validate them, to build them, but the internals are the ones who take control of their own sort of treatment. They like to be able to feel that the therapist is building their ego capacity. So, locus of control and help. Internals are better help than externals because externals believe that there is little they can do to improve their own physical condition or avoid disease. Whereas internals believe that they have a significant role in maintaining good health. Okay, so again, you can see a pattern here and a sort of um, inclination that it's better for internal to, to have or build an internal locus of control than an external locus of control. And this is sort of also the whole point of meditation, mindfulness, because it's trying to build in you that internal locus of control. So next we're gonna look at social cognitive theory. And it was proposed by Albert Bandura, who is also a big proponent here under the behaviorist movement. Now Albert Bandura, as you can see, very cute, uh, old man here in the picture. He uh, was born in a small farming community located among the wheat fields of Alberta, Canada. So he's from Canada and his parents had immigrated from Eastern Europe when they were teenagers. He accepted a position at Stanford University in 1953 and has remained there ever since. While at Stanford, um, he continued to build bridges between traditional learning theory and cognitive personality theories and between clinical psychology and empirically oriented approaches to understanding personality. Bandura had received numerous professional honors, including election to the presidency of the American Psych Association in 1974. Bandura identified several features unique to humans that must be considered to fully understand personality. And some of the features unique to humans that he proposed and identified were these four main ones. The first was reciprocal determinism, and it's when external and internal determinants of behavior are part of a system of interacting influences. So here, you know how we spoke about the environment, we spoke about the psyche. Now he comes in and he says it's actually a reciprocal determinism. So what that means is that there's a interplay between your external and internal environments and where they have this reciprocal quality that impacts how a person behaves. So af this affects both behavior and various parts of the system. His second uh, feature that he identified in human beings was imaginations. He said people use symbols and forethought as guides to future action. And he said, we imagine possible outcomes, calculate probabilities, set goals, and develop strategies. So there are all these symbols and, and forethought and things like that that people use to guide their future actions. It's not just, you know, what the environment says. It's not just what you think, feel, and believe, but it's also what you imagine. Then he proposed the idea of self-regulation. He said, self-regulation controls behavior in the absence of external reinforcements and punishments, right? So uh, people who are good at regulating their, their themselves, they, they don't depend as much on external or internal 
reinforcements and punishments. Observational learning was the last thing he proposed. He said people learn by observing other people's actions. So these were kind of the four main influencers of human behavior and personality in, in Albert Bandura's um, education. So here you see a Pandura's reciprocal determinism model and what it's basically saying is that your external factors, which are rewards and punishments, interact with your internal factors in a reciprocal manner. So you have beliefs, thoughts, expectations, and both in turn feed behavior. Okay, and so this one feeds behavior, behavior feeds external factors, and it's like a feedback loop. Research indicates that children learn, so observational learning and aggression, right? That's a great example. People, when he talks about people learning how to behave through observation, the example would be of aggression. So rehearsing aggression as when children play with toy guns is one step in the process. So research indicates that children learn aggression by imitating aggression models. Um, so... Aggression is a huge example of observational learning. Um, Bandura proposed a four-step aggression model, and he said that people must go through each of the four steps before exposure to aggression leads them to act aggressively. So it's not that you observe and then you act, but you have to go through these four steps in order to enact the observed behaviors. So first, you attend to the aggressive actions. Second, you remember the information. Third is you enact what is seen. And fourth is you expect that rewards will be forthcoming. Okay? So you attend to an aggressive action. You remember the information. So you attend, you observe, you remember, you enact, and then you expect. And all these four act together to predict your aggressive behaviors. A little bit of research on aggression. Um, mass media, majority of studies found that viewing aggression increases the likelihood of acting aggressively. Frequent exposure to aggressive models on television increases aggressive behavior in the short run and many years later. Research has also found that violent video games, especially where you're rewarded for killing police, soldiers, and all of these innocent bystanders, actually increases your aggression or aggressive behaviors. And this was especially worrisome among psychologists. So here you see a graph, and you see that um, in a video game, when participants were rewarded for killing people and doing aggressive acts, there they were asked after to fill up an aggression assessment. They got very high scores. Next, we're going to look at gender roles in observational learning. So people also learn how to behave masculine or feminine based on how they observe. So it's not just biological, how biologically predisposed you are to feeling like a boy or a girl or any other sex, but it is um, also the uh, modeling and the, the social learning that determines how, you, how your gender unfolds. And so m most little girls play dress up, girls put on their mother's clothes, jewelry, and so they're starting to identify with the mothers, and uh, but not m males, right? So the female is starting to identify with the female figure, which is her mom, versus, uh, vers whereas not the male. We would not expect to find little boys imitating this behavior. All right, so let's go to the next one. So when talking about masculinity and femininity, it's also important to see that there are different approaches to understanding it. Um, firstly, initial models of masculinity and femininity represented two extremes position on a single continuum, right? So as shown in the figure down here, you see that masculine is on this side, feminine is on this side, and so there's a mutual exclusive kind of quality to it. So the more ma manly you are, the less feminine you are, and so the traditional approach says that it's it's a it's so traditional approach requires 
to be replaced with more specific and less emotionally loaded labels, right? So there's a heavy emphasis on masculine, feminine. When you say masculine, there's more to do with agency, independent, assertiveness, control. With femininity, you associate communion, attachment, cooperation, interpersonal connection. And so the traditional approach is very like mutually exclusive. Like this is masculine, this is feminine. However, it's not the case in the new androgynous model of masculinity and femininity where they say that these two are independent traits. So people can be high on both, right? So it doesn't mean if you're high on one, you're not high on the other, right? It's like high on one, not high on the other, low on one, high on the other. It's not like that, but it can be both. You can be high on both, you can be low on both. So people who are highly masculine and also highly feminine, they can, they, could be they fall under the androgynous category people who are high on masculine low on feminine obviously they're masculine people who are low on masculine more high on feminine they're obviously more feminine and then you have people who are neither right so they're undifferentiated and so it maintains that the most well-adjusted person is both masculine and feminine, like under this category. It challenges the assumption that a person's gender should match his or her gender type, okay? So um, this kind of an androgyny model, it actually eliminates the fact that, you know, if you're this, you're not that. It could be a bit of both or neither. So again, traditional congruence model states that masculine men and feminine women are the most well-adjusted. Masculinity model, on the other hand, maintains that being masculine is the key to mental health. And androgyny model suggests that people whose behavioral repertoires lack either masculine or feminine behaviors are ill-prepared to respond to many situations they encounter. So you need both man, man and, fem and woman in in you and this is what Carl Jung proposed as well we have all of us have these unconscious um, archetypes one of them being the anima and the animus and which is like we have both the masculine and the feminine aspect of ourselves so gender type and interpersonal relationships reasons that make feminine and androgynous people preferable partners now think about this research has found that um, People who are more geared towards the feminine side or people who have both man and female in them are preferable as partners because feminine people score high on being sensitive to others' needs and who wouldn't like that, right? So if you're in a relationship with, let's say, a guy, and this is for the for the women out there, most women prefer men who are, who are either like have this androgynous traits which means they they're they, they have the sensitive side they like they when men get too masculine too aggressive too on the face too insensitive then women don't really like that and and same with men they also prefer women who are sensitive who are you know there for them and so um this this sensitivity is more of a feminine or androgynous quality and that's pref preferred um, in, in partners. Androgynous people are also more aware and better able to express romantic feelings. So now it's not just you being a sensitive person to the other one, but it's also that you're able to express your romantic feelings in a better manner. So feminine androgynous people are good at communicating. So they're sensitive and they express themselves well. And remember this, okay? regardless of where you are on the masculine feminine um criteria or trait system remember that if you are entering any important relationship or not you can always develop these traits like being sensitive to your partner knowing that it's important to express yourself communication is the fuel to all relationships the minute you stop communicating it's literally like no time that you're gonna strangle your own relationship so it's very important for you to communicate and to be sensitive to each other's needs so the applications, now that we've looked at the theories, some of the applications of, let's say, the classical conditioning is that you can condition people to elicit or to discard certain fears or certain 
type of belief or, or phobias, right? This comes in very handy. We know the infamous experiment of little Albert where he was, um, where loud noise, which made him afraid, was clubbed to white rats. And so he ended up being afraid of any furry white object. And so that's an example. In the same way, you could also extinguish fears. So classical conditioning applications, you could use it to eliminate or replace stimulus response association. So someone who is afraid of snakes, let's say, you expose them to snakes and then they're not afraid of snakes anymore. Or, you know, you club snakes to something that is, that's not dangerous. So every time the person touches a snake, they eat cotton candy. So they, they're in a they're in a very safe place. The snake doesn't bite them. They see they see cartoon characters of snakes that make them feel less heinous, less scary. So that eliminates this the stimulus response, which is oh snakes are dangerous. Well you start associating state snakes to something fun, something not dangerous. Systematic desensitization is also another aspect of this where you replace the old association of the fear stimulus and response by bringing in a new sort of um, association, right? You're systematically desensitizing it. The, the key component of systematic desensitization is that it's it's a systematic process. You're not really like going all in. You, you do it in, in steps and it's and it involves breathing and all of that. So you have a little bit of leeway when it comes to unconditioning yourself of that fear. Aversion therapy is you're altering problem behaviors by pairing aversive images with undesirable behaviors. So remember how the whole homosexual, homophobic movement where people were like, oh, homosexuals are not, it's not a healthy place to be. It's not a healthy way of living. And so they started giving them pills, which made them feel really gross every time they had thoughts. And so hoping that their their natural sexual desires would be clubbed with something aversive. So um, it really messed up the system because, you know, um, aversion therapy was very infamous for these type of treatments. And um, only because it, it's homosexuality comes from a natural place and you're not going to mess with something that's natural, but it was messed with. And this is just one example. Um, I guess the positive side of aversion therapy could also be, let's say you're dieting and you, you want to stop eating chocolates and maybe you can associate chocolate with something gross and you won't feel like eating chocolate anymore. So that's, that's probably a, a better example of how to use aversion therapy for your own benefit. Um, offering conditioning applications, therapists identified that target behavior, define it, and use like consequences. So in CBT and cognitive behavioral therapy, you can see chain analysis, functional assessments. All these are applications where people are basically rewarding you or, you know, the token economy system. So when you do a good behavior, you're rewarded. So let's say today you worked out for an hour. Your reward is you get to eat a lot, a little chocolate chip cookie. So let's say something like that. Or let's say um, you, you worked out for two hours yesterday and then today you checked your weight and it got less and that's your positive reinforcement. And so that's how operant conditioning can work in practical applications. The other is biofeedback. It requires special equipment that provides information about somatic processes. So biofeedback can be very helpful in, um, in helping with anxiety or situations where you feel where you're not feeling so well, what you could do is you could actually monitor how your body is reacting, your heartbeat, and so on and so forth. And when you do that, what happens is um, the biofeedback system, it, um, it kind of um, shows you that, okay, your heartbeat is really high now, breathe in, breathe out, and then you can see your heartbeat go down. You can actually get feedback about your biological system and in turn react to that. The other application is um, self-efficacy in psychotherapy. So if you can develop a level of 
efficacy that have to do with yourself that I am capable of this, I am capable of that, that it comes in very handy. So people do not alter their behavior until they make a decision to expend the necessary effort. So it, it comes down, boils down to what choice you make, what decision you make. An outcome expectation is the extent to which people believe actions will lead to a certain outcome. And an efficacy expectation is the extent to which people believe they can perform the actions that will bring about the particular outcome. Okay, so expectation is very important for you to manage these things if when it comes to application values as well, managing your expectations. Again, behavior observation methods uh, came out of Albert Bandura's work. Uh, and under assessment, people in the behaviorism school of thought, they use um, analog behavior observations. Um, you could observe people through directly observing them and recording behaviors. You could monitor your own self. That's another way of assessing yourself. You could be observed by others, right? So all of these are different assessment methods in which your behaviors can be recorded. Directly observing, monitoring yourself, or being observed by others. Now, the last two slides we'll talk about is the strengths of the approach. The basic strength of the behaviorist approach to understanding personality is that it sets a solid foundation in empirical research, right? So there's a lot of like movement towards the scientific aspect. And then the other advantage is that there's development of useful therapeutic procedures, right? So you have those, um, the systematic desensitization, exposure therapy, flooding, all of those are very are treatments based off of these conditioning principles. And it's also a very useful approach for certain populations, such as people who have phobia, who have like anxiety and things like that. Criticisms are that it's narrow in its description of human personality. As you can tell, it's it limits the complexity of human nature. It says, oh, you bring me a human and I can train him just with reinforcements, but that's not completely true because human beings have internal states of mind and that even though you can't measure if even though hard science may not want to measure those because they're not overtly seen they are still part of us and they do require our attention um, again human beings are more complex than lab animals so you cannot really you know simplify them as behaviors do that's one of the criticisms and there's reduction of observable behaviors to real issues of therapy um, so the other advantage is that it reduces to observable behaviors which distorts the real issues of therapy right so you come in and you're like I'm feeling all of these things and then okay you are programmed to feel a different way but what about the beliefs you hold maybe your, your, your beliefs should also be focused on your thoughts should also be focused on right so these are the basic criticisms of this approach. Here is a summary slide. Please do take a look at your own time. And that's the end of our lecture. Thank you so much for attending and for watching this presentation. All the best.